Welcome back everyone. We are now turning to Descartes' fourth meditation. And here Descartes continues uh, the specific questions which he has just ended on. Questions about the existence of God and the nature of God and our specific relationship to God in terms of knowledge or our specific relationship to God in terms of the fact that we're thinking things. And then also we see here, maybe as clear as any place, the general project of Descartes' meditations. So like I said, here we're building on and taking the next step in those slow patient steps towards the final points of the meditation. So since we just ended with the steps about what God is um, and uh, our own ability to be certain that God exists, we now start talking more about certainty and about God in the fourth meditation. That's the specific questions. But also, as clear as anywhere except for maybe, maybe the first meditation, we see Descartes' general goal here again. And his general goal is sort of two sides of the same coin. His general goal is to get rid of every mistake and error that he's ever made, to get rid of every falsity and untruth that's in his head. And the flip side of that is to know the things about which he can be certain. Remember, certainty in Descartes is not a feeling that someone has it's not a feeling you have when you're really, really sure about something. Certainty is a technical term for Descartes with a very specific meaning. And here I just want to say one of the difficult things when you're new to philosophy is the way that philosophers use words. This is true of scientists as well and any um, specialized scholar. But in philosophy, the philosophers will use words that you and I know. Of course, how else could they communicate with us? But they'll often give a very specialized or technical, precise definition, which usually isn't exactly what you and I would mean in everyday common discourse. So we see that with God last time, and my point here is that the same thing is about certainty this time. When I say God, whether you're uh, an atheist, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, Catholic, Presbyterian, whatever it may be, there's certain things that pop up into your head. A lot of people, if I say, God, give me one word, you're going to say something like love. Well, Descartes, he's not denying that. He's just saying, when I write the word God, I'll tell you what I mean. And I mean that thing that I said not necessarily the other connotations that, that we have in everyday life. So with God, he says, if you want to define the essence of God, the core meaning of what God is, he says he thinks you have to define that as omniscience, which is all-knowing, omnipotence, which is all-powerful, and eternity in time. You know, God, God doesn't die or run out of gas or something someday. So then, whenever he's talking about God later, you just have to recognize, and this is true of all philosophers and of all, um, all professors and all scientists and all scholars, is that they'll be talking about the word in the way they defined it. And they're not going to redefine it for you every single sentence, because that would be very boring to read. So you have to try to keep in mind the technical meaning that they gave it. Okay. So, returning to my point about one of the general goals of the meditations, one of the general goals that Descartes has is he says, I want ideas about which I can be certain. Just like God, you have an idea already of what we usually mean when we say certain. Now, Descartes isn't saying you're wrong to associate those meanings with that word certain. All he's saying is, hey, when you're reading my book, whenever you see certain or certainty or what he also calls clear and distinct ideas, clear and distinct, certain or certainty, 
you have to draw a mental equal sign next to it and then put something like the following definition. Certain ideas for Descartes are not ones that you feel really sure about. They are ideas that could not possibly be false. They are ideas that it's hard to even imagine them being false. They are ideas about which it's hard to even pretend you don't believe them. So really, certainty for Descartes is a property of, of specific ideas. Some ideas have certainty as a property. So ignoring all the evil genius, uh, demon, malicious demon stuff from before, just for you right now, normally, if I say two and three or five, that is a certain idea. Because you can say the words two and three or six, but can you really get yourself to believe that two and three are six? No. And if I say, okay, show me why two and three are five. You can show me, uh, that is you can construct sort of proof for why two and three are five. And you can't really like get as creative as you want. It's really hard to try to fake a proof that two and three equals six or 12 or something. So certainty in Descartes is a property of certain of, of some specific ideas. They are certain, meaning that you could not doubt them if you tried. But normally when you and I say we're certain about something, it's like, oh, my gut just tells me. I know he's not a trustworthy guy. I'm, I'm certain about it. I can just feel it in my bones. Or we'll say, no, no, I'm certain that's the person who robbed the store because uh, I was standing right outside the door when she came out with a bag full of money in her hand. And that's a completely fine way to use it in common conversation, right? But Descartes would say, you could imagine, though, that the woman was carrying something that looked like a bag of money but wasn't. Unlikely, but it's possible. And you see there's a difference between that and two and three is five. I don't think you say, when you say two and three is five, that you go, well, it's likely. I feel, I feel pretty sure about two and three equaling five. You just say flat out no. Regardless of how I feel, two and three certainly is five all by itself. So, all that to say, meditation four is a lot less dramatic than meditations one, two, and three. One, we get him saying, I'm going to wipe away everything I ever knew. One, as it turns into two, he says, well, what if I'm in a dream, a hallucination, I can't get out of this how do I fix it? Two, sliding into three, he says, wait a second, there are a few certain ideas, little light at the end of the tunnel, and they're very dramatic. Four is not so dramatic, it's not so much like a, you know, like a Hollywood movie, but it's very important because it's sort of where Descartes gets back to his most um, central project here, and it really starts to find traction again. It starts to get more content and detail. So what meditation for about is Descartes further distinguishing when he can be certain or when an idea is certain, when it's true but uncertain, when it's false, and when it's actually an impossible idea, an idea that couldn't possibly be true. And just like everything else in Descartes, he says, we don't yet know what we can be certain about in terms of physical matter. We don't yet know what we can be certain about in terms of our body. So most of what he's going to do here is going to tell him about himself as a thinking thing. So for instance, Descartes says that he thinks he can prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's one part of your brain which thinks things. And then there's another part of your brain, or mind we should say, that decides on things and chooses things. There's a part of your brain that most, sorry, part of your mind that most philosophers would call understanding or reason or perception, something like that. And then there's another part of your mind or soul 
which chooses things. So if you and I see, a, a good way to distinguish this is you and I are standing next to each other. We grew up in the same country. We're both really smart. You know, we're basically the same. You and I are looking in a certain direction, and I'll be darned, but there's a giraffe standing there. A big old giraffe is standing there. Now, you and I both perceive the same thing. We see the giraffe, our eyes are absorbing it, and our mind sort of registers the shape or the word giraffe, whatever it may be. Okay, that's one part of our uh, mind or soul. There's another part, though, Descartes says, which he calls will. Sometimes it's called judgment. In certain contexts, you would want to call it a choice. So once more, the second part of our mind or soul is will or choice or judgment. And what Descartes says is these are two completely different chunks of your brain and they do different kinds of work. So you and I see this giraffe and we both say, whoa, is it? Yeah, that's a giraffe. I wonder what it's doing here in the classroom. Now, you want to walk up and pet the giraffe because you like giraffes. I like giraffes, but I'm, I'm scared. I'm a little skittish. So you and I perceive our reason or our minds understand that there is a giraffe in front of us. But you choose to go up and pet the same giraffe, and I choose to fall back and not pet the same giraffe. So you see how there's clearly got to be two different things going on because in one your perception saw the giraffe and then your will decided to go up and pet it in me my perception same thing saw the giraffe but then i didn't do the thing you did i didn't walk up and pet it so there's one part of my mind or soul which is in agreement with yours doing the same work perceiving the giraffe there's another part of my mind or soul, which in this case is doing something different, not petting, choosing not to pet instead of choosing to pet like you did. Does that make sense? Right? It's the same thing. I show you a math problem, two and two is four. Right? Your understanding, your reason, your perception sees that and understands it. The person sitting right next to you, sees the same thing, understands it just as well. But then you choose to say, Professor, why are we doing so much basic math in Philosophy 101? The other person didn't choose to say that in reaction. So there's two different parts of your brain. There's one that understands two and two is four, and in this example, there's another part of you that chooses to say something about that. So, that is going to be very important. That's very important for the fourth meditation, specifically. It's very important for Descartes' general project. Because what I will explain to you in one second, I'm going to end this recording in just, a, in just a second and then start a new one. When I give you more details in the next recording, what you'll see is that Descartes says, because will is a different part of the mind than reason or intellect or perception, you can always, and I mean always, you can always avoid errors and mistakes no matter what's presented to your eyeballs, basically. You can always, always choose not to judge with your will, and if you choose not to judge with your will, then you can never judge incorrectly. If you never judge incorrectly, you're literally never, ever, ever wrong, and you would therefore avoid error 100% of the time your whole life. So once more, what I'm doing, I've done it in a few of the other recordings. I'm giving you the context first, Here's why we're reading the fourth meditation. I'm giving you like a summary, a short summary of what the main argument or points are for today. Will is different from intellect. That prevents, that allows you to prevent error, etc. 
And then, at least for this one, the next recording will be the details, where I give you the why or the because, the proof for the, the argument I just summarized. So I just told you, and I'll repeat it, I just told you what the main point of today is. But writing down that main point is important, but what we're going to do next is really important, where I show you what all that means, why it's probably true, so on, so forth. So once more, I'll repeat the main claim or argument for today. In your mind or soul, there are two different powers of thought, which are actually very, very different. To make a mistake requires you using both of those kinds of mind power or soul power. Since both are required, both will and intellect, perception, whatever you want to call it. Okay. If you never choose to judge whether something's true or false, then you can never judge incorrectly. Now we just reverse that. What does it mean to never judge wrongly? It means to never be wrong, which means sort of to always be right. So that's the main point from today is Descartes going to piece together a bunch of things and say he's just shown you this is the shocking part. This is where it does get dramatic today. He says, I will show you a way to avoid error 100%. I will show you a way that if you follow it, you can make it so you are completely immune and protected from error and mistake. He's going to show you a way where you can protect and defend yourself against every possible error for the rest of your life. That's pretty powerful and dramatic. So... Stop this recording now. I know I haven't asked you a question yet. We'll get some more questions in the, uh, the second recording for today. Okay, thank you everyone.